right, so before I proceed, um, I know I wasn't supposed to be, I wasn't scheduled for yesterday, but I actually joined in because I wanted to listen to the speakers. And uh, what, I mean, the, the sessions were brilliant. Uh, I must confess, I joined because I was thinking, I was hoping to see some expo that I could use for my own presentation today, right? Um, what I've noticed is that everybody has been talking about, you know, um, what has been done in the Western world, you get, and all that. And that's all well and good, you get. But what really matters is the learnings that we take from it. So I'm not particularly going to focus so much on a review of what has been done by other people. But I'm going to focus a lot on a review of ourselves as creatives and how we can navigate this new normal that we find ourselves in. So um, I'm going to be talking more about how the trends of now uh, 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 or how the new normal is shaping the trends of now. Um, for that, I have a question. I know that no one can answer but I just want you to internalize it. So my question is this, what if a fish can't swim? I mean, that's weird, right? Fishes are meant to swim, right? So we're gonna be answering this question in a bit, but uh, let me go on to the next slide. Uh, apologies, my PowerPoint skills are not very great. So my PowerPoint might be a bit, uh, might be a bit ugly. So just bear with me. So let's start from the very beginning, All right? What you see here is the, the, the basic unit of life. Yeah, I know that uh, the unit of matter is atoms. Sorry, I'm going biological, but I, I need to touch on a few things. Right, I know that the unit of matter is atoms and all that or something like that, correct me if I'm wrong, but the unit of life is the cell you get. So let's take a look at, you know, these two different cells. Oh dear, what's going on? All right, so we have the animal cell, right? And we have the plant, uh, the fish cell actually. So what exactly, if, if you look at these two cells, you find that both of them actually, even though they belong to two different organisms, right, they actually have some similarities. You get, they're basically similar. You can see that both of them have a cell membrane, both of them have the nuclear membrane, both of them have the nucleus, both of them have the cytoplasm, and then they have the other, um, details, the, the DNA, mitochondria, and all that, right? So basically, even though these two cells are different, they both have the same basic composition, right? So it's safe for us to say that all cells, regardless of, you know, what organism they belong to, have four main parts, the cell membrane, the nuclear membrane, the nucleus, and the cytoplasm, right? So now that we have that knowledge, let's take a look at it, um, two other elements. Oh, sorry. Um, we have already gone through this. The cell is a cell everywhere. So now, um, why exactly do cells function differently in different organisms? What exactly is the reason why? What I mean by this is, why do animal cells why do animal cells come together and become, uh, come together to form animals? And why do fish cells come together to form fishes? Why don't animal cells come together to form fishes? And why don't fish cells come together to form animals? Bear with me, I'm trying to hit something. So let's take a look at some of the, the, some of the land animals and their equivalents in the ocean world or the, the water world, so to speak. So what you see on the screen is a cow, right? And the equivalent of that, you know, I wanted this to be interactive, but I'm just going to blaze through anyway. The equivalent of this is 
a manatee, also known as a sea cow, right? So what I'm doing is I'm actually just looking at the, the general composition of these organisms. I'm looking at the, I'm, I'm basing my comparisons based on their outward appearance and their size, right? Next, we have a horse. And I mean, it's safe to say that the equivalent of that in terms of similarity of look and in terms of uh, 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 outward appearance would be the seahorse, right? And then next we have a dog. And I think that the equivalent of that in the sea would be a seal. Have you seen these guys? These guys are actually very brilliant. I went to a seal show at SeaWorld in Durban some years ago, and I was amazed at just how alike they were or how similar they were to dogs. They could listen to commands, they could clap, they could spin balls on their noses and all that. And it was amazing. So for the last one, we've got an elephant. Now, in terms of the outward appearance and the size and all that, I believe that the equivalent of the elephant in the sea is the whale, right? So that brings me back to the first question, which is, why is it that the cells in the elephant come together to form the elephant? And why is it that the, whales come to get, uh, the cells in the whales come together to form the whales? Why, doesn't the, or why don't the cells in the whales come together to form the elephant? And why don't the cells in the elephants come together to form the whales? The answer is simple. It's adaptability. You get it. And the reason for that is that it, the environment that the cell finds itself actually determines how the cell responds and to what functions it has to assume. You get it. The environment plays a critical role in how we function, in how we become who we are, you get. And this is why animals do what they do. They walk, they crawl, they climb, they jump, and all that, you get, sorry. And this is also why most fishes swim, okay? So now let's take a look at two other elements. Let's take a look at organism versus organization. Right? What exactly is the difference between these two? Right? For me, yes, they are very different. You can say one is a living entity, the other is inanimate, it's not living. But um, in some ways, I beg to differ. I feel like the, they have quite a number of similarities. You see, the most important similarity for me between these two is the fact that while an organism is made up of cells, an organization is also made up of its own kind of cells, you get. And its own kind of cells are people. That is you and I. So the ability of cells to adapt to, excuse me, sorry. Oh, that's so rude. The ability of cells to adapt to its environment is what actually guarantees our chances of survival and it's what makes our, our chances even higher you get whether it is organism or organization right so let's ask ourselves this question in this era that we find ourselves in this pandemic right are trends being fast-tracked or are new trends you know currently in the making right and to do that i'm going to actually break it down into um three uh, uh three entities the industries the companies and the individual right now for a lot of people right uh this new normal this era that we find ourselves in is not so it, it it's not a lot of fun really you get for a lot of people, they would call it a pandemic, they would call it a disaster, they would call it a, a, a natural hazard and everything and all that. But um, my partner and I have a different term for what, we, what is happening right now. And that is, instead of it being a pandemic, instead of seeing it as a pandemic, what we are seeing or what we choose to call it is 
the digital accelerator. So to many, COVID-19 is a pandemic, but to the wise, it's actually a digital accelerator. I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. Digital actually imitates life, right? I know the saying goes, the, the actual saying is art imitates life or life imitates art and all that. But in this era that we find ourselves in, digital actually imitates life. And why is that? You get, it's because we have limited, now that we have limited access to the activities that we usually do on a normal day, right? What's happening is that we are trying to regain some sense of normalcy of our usual lifestyle through the digital space, you get it. So that's why you have, you know, virtual concerts that suddenly have become the norm of the day. That's why you have drive-through movies now, things that were not, things that were not um, so popular are suddenly becoming popular. Cinemas are now moving to the virtual space. You get shopping has virtually moved online. Meetings are now virtual. You and I, uh, a few months ago, we probably would have uh, been in, a, in the same physical location. And uh, I would have been sitting either amongst you or, or standing in front of you or something and taking this presentation. And you would be asking me questions that I probably would not be able to answer. You get poor. Um, things are changing. There is a higher dependence now on the digital space to regain some sense of normalcy, you get. And uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, industries, companies, you get, are beginning to hop on that trend, right? So let's start with the industries. Remember, I, I, I mentioned three entities, the industries, the, um, the, company in the digital industries. And as a case study, I'm going to look at entertainment, being music and movies, right? So for music, I mean, we're familiar with these guys, um, the iTunes, the Deezers, the Spotify's, and the, the YouTubes, right? They've actually been at the forefront of uh, digital transformation even before the pandemic. Right, they were one of the first to begin this. Um, but with the pandemic, you find that consumption rates have actually soared. Now, like um, Uzo rightly mentioned, people are actually needing to consume more content. So, content more than ever is now the ruler, it's now king. You get so consumption rates have soared on these uh, uh, platforms and all that. And what that means is that the platforms can't stay the way they were. They've had to evolve, you get. They've had to pivot, right? So, for instance, um, if you look at iTunes, iTunes doesn't just, sorry, iTunes doesn't just, um, uh, what's the word? It doesn't just show you or, or, or give you access to music, it does a lot more now. It gives you access to music, it gives you access to music videos, it gives you access to um, the lyrics of the song you get and all that. Um, YouTube, for example, was pretty much just, you know, um, a hub where people could come in and, you know, drop their content, their video content, and others could watch and everything. But YouTube too has pivoted, you get. And it's pivoted into YouTube music, which I want to believe is doing very well because it's now encroaching the iTunes, Spotify marketplace and all that, right? So now let's take a look at the movie industry, for example, right? Um, we have the Amazon Primes, we have the Hulus. I mean, we've, we've had all these platforms for a while, the Hulus, the Amazon Primes, the Netflix is the, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, the HBOs and all that. You know, they've been there, okay? But for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just gonna talk about the two most popular in Nigeria, which are DSTV and Netflix. So let's take a look at DSTV, right? Now, when DSTV began, um, it was a breath of fresh air. I don't know 
if a lot of you remember those days when we would go, we would rush back home from school uh, just to sit in front of the TV at five minutes or 10 minutes to 4 p.m. And what we were doing was basically just waiting and watching those, that multicolored screen and anticipating what, uh, uh, anticipating the children's bells that was going to start by 4 p.m. And at that time, um, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, I was, there, was, there was no time after that, that, I mean, how do I put this now? English fails me. At that time, I was never happier. I was, I was so happy, what, that's what I mean. I was so happy anytime I heard the, the national anthem beginning. Dun, 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 dun. You understand? and all that because I knew this was what was going to come. But if you notice, they already had a schedule, you get. So essentially, what um, local TV was giving us was pre-programmed content, you get. Now, DSTV now came on the scene, and DSTV brought a breath of fresh air, you get. Although what it brought was still pre-programmed content, right? but it gave us a lot more content. So you see, the truth is we've actually been crazy for content for a long time, even before digital became a thing, right? Now, DSTV gave us a lot more content, and that's why a lot of us, a lot of our parents then, you know, gravitated towards DSTV because then we didn't have to just um, sit and watch the uh, network news um, or, or, uh, or what they call this news line that happened on Sundays and all that. We could actually watch CNN, Fox and all that, everything. And that was a breath of fresh air for us. But underline the, the, the keyword, pre-programmed audiovisual content, right? We had no choice. It was like on a food roaster, what we get is ever today, ever, Tuesday, ever, Wednesday, ever, Thursday, you get, and you had no choice. Maybe your, your passion is, or your favorite meal is actually rice, or maybe you feel like eating rice, but you can't eat rice because ever is what's handed to you anyway. So guess what? Consumers had no control. Then what happened? Netflix came on board. Now Netflix came on board and gave consumers what DSTV could not give at that time which was control, you get. So consumers could actually choose what they wanted to watch at any point in time, right? And people began to gravitate towards Netflix, right? So what happened? DSTV pivoted as well and adapted to offer control. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. It's not COVID, don't worry. So DSTV adapted to offer control right? Uh, they came out with the PVR decoders, the explorers, and all that. You get. So with those decoders, you could actually pause, rewind, record, get, um, do your catch-up, or, or watch your favorite shows on catch-up. Or you could even rent movies on the box office, which was really cool. It's really cool. You get. But the problem with that was that price was still an issue. Why? Because you still needed hardware in order to access these things. You get now Netflix had no need for hardware except maybe your laptop, right? And data. But Netflix had no need for hardware. All Netflix required was a subscription fee, which was not even so expensive. Even till now, it's not so expensive. To watch Netflix on about four screens, I think it's about 4K or so. And everything. Even I haven't subscribed to DSTV in a while because I mean Netflix is satisfying my needs. So one would think that Netflix, you know, would pretty much sit pretty or sit on its oars and believe that oh, you know, they are ruling this particular share of markets now and all that, and um, there's no need for them to adapt or evolve, right? But you're wrong. Netflix did not stop there. Netflix pivoted right? <laughs> and it pivoted from being just a content distribution hub. I didn't understand that. Sorry, I'm not talking to you. What's your problem? Huh? Sorry, it's uh, Bixby. So Netflix pivoted from just being a content distribution hub 
right, to becoming a, uh, to also delving into content creation. So all of a sudden, we started seeing things like a Netflix original series. You understand? And uh, you would think that, okay, that would be the end of it. I mean, they've, they've encroached, sorry, um, they've encroached into um, the, the, the movie space and uh, the, the MGMs and all that. They've done that. But to be honest, they didn't stop there. You get, they came up with something else which actually creates, uh, which actually has more relevance to what we are, uh, the situation we are currently in at the moment. And that is the Netflix party. The Netflix party is pretty much the cinema experience in your home or wherever you are, you get. Now, because of this pandemic, Right? We are not able to go to the cinemas. We are not able to um, uh, socialize as much as we would have loved to. You get, but Netflix created a platform where you and I could be in different locations geographically and still be able to watch the same movies real time and still talk and communicate as though we were in the same living room or in the same cinema hall watching this same movie. You get, and you could have as many participants as possible. In fact, the more the merrier. So it actually brought the cinema experience into your home, <coughs> right? And that's what it's been with different industries, the transports with Uber, Bolt, hospitality with Airbnb, etc., and all that. Uh, there's been a lot of um, creativity, you know, coming out because of the need, right, to adjust people's lifestyles from uh, what they used to be to what they have to be at the moment. So there was already a gradual shift in how the game is played. And this is why we call the pandemic a digital accelerator. Because see, it's not like these platforms did not exist at that time or, or before the pandemic, right? It's that the, the, the platforms not only have pivoted, but even the dependence on those platforms have increased. So the pandemic has actually accelerated the dependence on the digital space. It's accelerated the dependence on the process. Who would think that right now companies would be um, playing in, and our companies would be operating remotely. Who would have thought that you get? But that's becoming, it's just becoming a, a, a normal way of life right now, right? So to understand the marketing communications industry, let's, you know, delve briefly into um, company operations. So for the companies, right? According to the Harvard Business Review, um, I was reading an article on that, and uh, if, a few facts there struck me. One is that 14% of companies actually outperform, you know, both historically and competit um, competitively because they invest in new growth areas. Um, it's sort of sad that, you know, the percentage is actually low. You get, but that's really because only a few companies are willing to be bolder and chart new terrains or pivot, in other words, right? So, right now, what companies really, really need right now in order to survive is imagination. Now, it's one of the hardest things to keep alive under pressure especially in the era that we're in, right? But it's actually needed now more than ever. And when I talk about imagination, um, I'm not talking about imagination just in terms of, you know, the creative space. I'm also talking about imagination in terms of the business offerings, the, the structure, the operational systems and all that in order to keep, you know, that business alive in this era because businesses are dying by the day. Now, one thing that businesses do 
right? Or there are a number of, there's a metamorphosis, so to speak, you get when a, a, a global crisis hits. There's a metamorphosis that businesses undergo when a global crisis hits. And the first thing they do is they, first of all, they rapidly react and defend their market. You get. I didn't understand that. I think I'm going to have to switch this guy off. He's not minding his business. Sorry. Sorry about that. All right. So one of the first reactions that businesses have is um, they, they, uh, they first react rapidly and they defend their market. You get, they defend their market share, they defend their, their relevance, you know, in the, in the lives of the, the, their target market and all that. Now, um, it's not a bad thing to do, really, because it's just a natural knee-jerk rea uh, reaction. If somebody dumped you in a large body of water, for example, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to trash about. You trash your arms, you, you know, sink, come up, trash and everything. Why? Because you're trying to survive. That is your first reaction you get. So that's where you see, you know, budget cuts. You see um, uh, salary, salary slashes. You see companies reducing the number of uh, staff members that they have and everything. You get those are rapid reactions that need to be taken in order for them to survive. And unfortunately, advertising is one of the industries that has been hit the hardest by this because a lot of them, a lot of companies have cut their advertising budgets, you get, in order to be able to save the money they have because they can't predict um, what the future is to hold, you get. Now the next thing, the next stage of their metamorphosis is that they start to, once they start to get used to the environment that they find themselves in, the new environment that they find themselves in, they start to implement plans you get to endure the anticipated recession. You get because they know that okay, now with the pandemic uh, that we have. The economic is uh, going to experience a downturn. The global economy is going to experience a downturn. You understand? I mean, the aviation industry at the start of the pandemic lost over $13 billion. That's huge, man. You get. And that's just for one industry. You get. So they start to implement plans. You get to endure the anticipated re uh, recession. So let me go back to my analogy of being dropped in a large body of water. After you've trashed for a while, you get, you start to come to terms with your situation. You get, so you start to calm down and you start to think, what can I do? Is there a floating log somewhere that I can hold on to? You get, so that I can at least endure the, I can at least last longer on the water, right? Now, as these companies get used to the market situation, right, they start to focus on rebounding, you get, and they start to make adjustments to portfolios and channels. I talked about Netflix and how Netflix has been able to pivot a number of times in order to be flexible enough to adapt to the, the, the system or the, the, the current uh, environment that we all find ourselves in, right? And finally, after they've done this, you get their focus would then now shift to reinventing by seeking opportunity in diversity, you get. So while a lot of people say, oh, um, the, this, this pandemic is, is a disaster and everything, there are people who are actually cashing out. Unfortunately, a lot of the people that are cashing out aren't even in advertising. You get, you find the in the, the influencers, the online influencers, social media influencers, getting more creative by the moment. <coughs> more people randomly are becoming more creative by the content they put out there, you get. And they are becoming more popular with that, you get. And uh, very soon, they too would become influencers. They too would start to earn money and start to cash out. You get, and I've noticed something about the, uh, 
content that is being put out there by these um, random people. They are not advertising professionals, but they are actually being very creative with what they put out there. So much so that some of their contents can actually rival some of our ads you get. And that actually should make us ask ourselves a question. If we are the professionals you get in advertising or marketing communication, so to speak, then what are we doing? you get to gain control of our industry and steer our industry in the right direction instead of, um, uh, 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 instead of letting it be bashed by the current environment. <laughs> now, we've talked about the uptake of you know, virtual interaction platforms. You know, platforms like Zoom, Google Hangouts, Microsoft Teams, they've suddenly become the order of the day. You get, as Uzo mentioned rightly earlier on, I mean, he talked about working from home. This was something that was a dream for a lot of us. You get back then, we would go to the office and we'd be like, man, do we really have to be in the office? You get, can we just do this thing from home? After all, it's just for us to be able to send emails, to be able to communicate via phone or via uh, WhatsApp or whatever and everything. Can't we just do it from home? Well, guess what? We are doing it from home now. And uh, from the reports I'm getting, a lot of people actually do miss the office because now they don't really have a schedule of uh, their working hours, a fixed schedule. They pretty much work randomly throughout the day and all that. So it's a bit more tasking, it's a bit more difficult. But that's not the point. The point is that <coughs> companies have started relying a lot on these things you get or these platforms, right? And the global pandemic has created, like I said, that unprecedented shift in the dependence on these platforms to heal their organs. Because the, the, we need to ad, uh, adhere to the social distancing rule and everything, it's very difficult for companies to actually bring staff members together under one roof. So the next, viable solution would be these virtual platforms. So here's the thing, right? There's a great part of that, uh, and there's a bad part of it, right? Now, the great part of it is that a lot of companies are now restructuring their businesses around this WF, uh, WFM, work from home trend, and they are realizing how much they are saving on overhead costs. So. Things like fuel, diesel, you get power generation, electricity bills, um, data, and all that. They don't have to spend as much anymore. Their operating expenses have actually reduced, you get. So in other words, they are spending less to keep the company alive. And my, by my estimation or, 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 or my prediction, I think that some companies, um, when, when things by the grace of God finally revert back to normal. Some companies are not going to want to revert so quickly back to the way things were pre-COVID. And that is evident by, you know, Twitter um, putting out a, a, a memo that stated that three quarters of their staff members would now permanently work from home. You get so that's the great part for companies, right? They don't have to spend so much. But the bad part, well, the bad part actually depends on it depends on you. You get it depends on what you have to bring to the table. You get so companies are yes, like you said, companies are realizing that they can actually cut costs on salaries and allowances, but they're also realizing that they don't need to have bloated staff uh, numbers. So you find a lot of companies, you know, switching to lean, mean teams, you get, and all that. And that actually puts a lot of, or, or it, uh, the owners, that actually determines uh, uh, what your stand in the company would be, you get. What I mean by that is, 
what you have to offer, you get, is what determines your value in the market, in the job market, you get. And I'm going to get to that soon, right? Now, let's look at Marcom's advertising. Now, the key word is innovation, you get. But what I've noticed, um, a lot of these things are actually my, my opinion. A lot of what I'm talking about are my opinions. Um, feel free to disagree with me if you want. You get. The key word is innovation, right? Uh, and we've we've sort of bastardized what innovation actually means. I mean, like we, maybe bastardized is too strong a word, but we've used it very loosely. You get, we say, oh, we want to create innovative stuff, innovative stuff, innovative stuff. But guess what? When a client comes to us for solutions to their marketing uh, communications problems, we most likely go back to them with the same old, same old. You get but you see, the current reality that we find ourselves in is not going to allow such to happen as frequently as you know, it used to. So what you find now would be that ad agencies would actually stop being ad agencies, you get, and they would start to become human-centered experience companies. What that means is that they're going to be selling experiences on two levels, brand experiences, which then lead to customer experiences, you get. Um, ad agencies, uh, clients right now are not looking for splinter agencies. What that means, or what I mean by that is, <coughs> when a client wants to have, um, or when a client has a, a media uh, brief or a, a need for some media strategy, they go to a media focused agency. When they need digital, they go to a digital focused agency. When they need advertising, they go to an advertising focused agency. And when they need experiential, they go to an experiential focused agency. <coughs> but right now, remember, marketing spend has been slashed for most of them. You get. So what's happening right now is that clients are no longer willing to spend double or triple their budgets anymore. It's like going to a store you get and you want to buy a unit of one item. That, that's you, you want to buy the unit of an item. You get, now that unit comes at say maybe 15 naira. You understand, right? Or let me use the local marketplace, for example. You want to buy a unit of uh, or maybe a tomato and one tomato makes say 10 naira or 20 naira. So don't go to the market though. So I don't know the prices. I'm just giving examples. You get now that unit costs this amount, right? But what you find out is that people usually buy in bulk because a natural discount always comes with buying in bulk. So that same philosophy actually applies to companies right now in this era. Because now they don't want to buy in units. They don't want to pay in units anymore with, with different agencies. They'd rather just consolidate all their expenditure in one agency that can offer multiple services you get. So they don't have to suffer multiple billings anymore. Right? Now, agency operations also will have to be restructured to actually accommodate more skill sets into units or sales. And what I mean by this is, these are things I'm actually seeing, these are trends I'm seeing, is that as um, unlike some months or years ago where you know the primary uh, roles in a typical ad agency would be client service, uh, strategy, um, ad director, and copywriters, and all that. Right now, you find agencies hiring more skill sets. You have agencies hiring content uh, managers or community managers. You have them hiring tech. You get, um, you have them, you have them hiring different kinds, I mean, production managers, directors. You get um, people that can direct their, their TV uh, shoots and all that so that they too don't have to be paying in units. They too can consolidate and also, you know, make more of a profit. So now there is a point of convergence where one creative company can offer the customer, that's the client, you get experiences from just about 
every touch point you get, whether it's advertising or media or digital or consultancy or strategy, name it. And this now brings us to the most important element of all, which is where I've been trying to come to uh, for a while, the self of the organization. You see, we, the people, are actually, and without us, there is actually no company, there is no agency, there is no organization. We are the cells. We are the ones that actually keep the agency alive. You get it. But I asked a question earlier, and uh, it was more of what are you bringing to the table? You see, what you bring to the table actually determines your value in the job market. You get it. Now, <clears throat> I remember that Uzo mentioned something, and I was very happy when he mentioned it, uh, that he too is diversifying in his skill set. So yes, he is a creative director, he's also a CEO and all that, but he is diversifying into web design, you get it, and web building and all that, you get it. We cannot rest on our oars as, and this is why I said it's time for us to, as we're reviewing, you know, stuff that has been done outside the country, we also should review ourselves internally. Now, who are we internally? We cannot rest on our oars and say, oh, I am a copywriter. I am an art director. This is my course, my course trend, and that's what I'm going to stick to. No, M me that I'm sitting here, you get talking with you. I'm a concept developer. I'm a writer. I'm uh, an audio editor, or and to an extent, an audio engineer as well. You get, and I'm also a, a, a producer, both for music and for um, TV. You get. So, what exactly are you bringing to the table? Those things that you're bringing to the table. How relevant are they in this current reality that we are becoming what I'd like to call a dinosaur? Now, a dinosaur is actually uh, a, the, the dinosaur was actually the ruler of the, the forest at that time. You get the supreme predator, you get and all that fearful, um, uh, fearless, and every animal or, or organism was scared of it because, hey, I mean, it's a dinosaur, you understand? But guess what? They're opposite at this point, right? Now, being obsolete as a dinosaur doesn't quite help the dinosaur's um, reputation, does it? Because, yeah. If you were a former champion, that's what you would be, a former champion, not the current champion. You get all you would have would be a legacy. You get, but are you building new legacies or has your legacy stopped? So let's go further, right? So essentially what I'm trying to say is that we as creatives, you get, we call ourselves creative badasses, but maybe it's time to step up to that name and actually be badasses at what we do. So let's do some introspective, uh, 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 introspect, introspection, so to speak. Sorry, English fills me at the times I need it the most. Are you a digital strategist that only does digital strategy or can you do business transformational strategy as well? You get it. What are your, what, what other, how are you pivoting in order to remain relevant? You get, are you a creative that can only think for conventional media? That is when clients come and they ask you for, uh, a mark, uh, uh, they ask you for uh, a, a, a communication solution. Your first point of call is TV, radio, print, outdoor. Or are you thinking about how we can go a bit further I mean, in the space of virtual concerts, I mean, everybody has been doing the same thing, same thing, same thing. So what was initially innovative has become regular, virtual concerts, you get. But for those of us that were aware of it at the time, and those of us that are aware of the, the game called Fortnite, um, there was a time that they actually held a virtual concert 
in the game because Fortnite is played using the internet. So people actually interact. The players actually interact with each other and they form, they form teams. And these guys actually brought Travis Scott in, created a 3D model of Travis Scott and an entire video of Travis Scott interacting with the game elements right there in the game. And guess what? It drew in over 12 million uh, viewers worldwide, both people that were players and those that were not. You get now, that was innovative. And that didn't happen a long time ago. It actually happened this year. It happened, uh, I think, while we in Nigeria were still on lockdown, right? Now, if you're a client service, what exactly are you doing? Are you just the client service? Uh, or are you, are you a, a mess? I like to call them messenger service. You get a FedEx career service where all you do is just take a brief from a client, deliver it to strategy or creative, and then collect the rest from strategy or creative and then deliver it to clients. You get, or are you able to actually sit with the client and interrogate the client on the business itself, the client's business itself? You see, um, my partner and I have had situations where clients will come to us and say, oh, we have this particular, um, this particular um, work that we need you guys to do. We need to sell this product or sell this service. You get, and what we do usually is we first of all start to interrogate, you get the back end of the service and also maybe the, the business structure as well you get, sorry, the platform structure, you get. And if you find a fundamental flaw, you get, we can advise the clients that, look, you know what? Don't go to communication yet, fix this. And we'll tell you how to fix this flaw, you get. So that when you do go to communication, right, what you're selling is watertight, it's waterproof, and it will actually deliver on promises that you are claiming uh, it will deliver on. You get, and when you do things like that, you find out that clients would actually appreciate you a lot more because now you're no longer just an agency person. You have actually become a vested partner, somebody that they can run to when they have issues. You get that they are finding it difficult to solve, even if those issues are not creative because they understand, they, they can tell now that you actually understand their business, right? And if you're a content writer, I'm just picking randomly, sorry. So if you're a content writer, are you just focused on writing for one specific channel? Say, okay, I only write for social media, you get, or I only write for blogs. <coughs> what else do you do? You get, what else are you writing for? You get, so as creative people, you get, I believe everybody is creative in their own rights, regardless of what occupation or career path they, they've chosen. But as creative people, right, the way companies and industries are pivoting to manage the, um, the, the situation, the environment that we're in, the way they are pivoting to adapt to the environment, what are we doing? You get, are we pivoting as well? Are we adapting or are we slowing going extinct like the dinosaur? We've got to be a lot more than what uh, we actually have. I actually quite like this picture. I mean, it's, it's a multi-purpose tool and that's what we actually should be. Because these days, as far as the creative community is concerned, um, the statement, a jack of all trades, master of none, is being flipped on its head. Because as far as the creative community is concerned these days, the jack of all trades has to be master of all, you get it. Now, maybe not all, but at least have different skill sets you get that you can bring to the table. Um, so let's go back to our question at the very beginning. What if a fish can't swim? I grabbed this online from uh, the sprucepets.com. And what it actually says is that fish suffering from swim bladder disorder exhibit a variety of symptoms that primarily involve buoyancy, including sinking to the bottom or floating at the top of the tank or floating upside down or on their sides or struggling to maintain a normal position. 
Affected fish may eat normally or may have no appetite at all. That analogy for me describes um, our current reality. You get, we are in a situation where if we're going to survive, we've got to be able to swim. You can't stay still and expect that the phytoplankton are going to come to you and you know, you'd, you'd feed. You've got to be able to swim, right? Now, COVID has actually thrown us into a white ocean. Thankfully, thankfully that it's a white ocean because a white ocean actually is, it has more opportunities you get. Now, like I said, we need to pivot. And where we pivot to determines where, um, whether we'll find ourselves in the red ocean or the blue ocean. I don't know. I want to believe that we're all very familiar with you know, the blue ocean and red ocean strategies or concepts. But for those who aren't, I'm just going to summarize quickly. You see, the red ocean right, is saturated. There are too many players in the same line. You get doing the same thing. So customers have too many options. You get so they are divided and there are not many fish, in quotes, in the sea for you to grab. So if we are playing in the red ocean, you're actually going to work twice as hard to get not so much, so to speak. Now, if you are in the blue ocean, right, the blue ocean will mean that you're pivoting, you're carving a niche for yourself. You get, and because what you're carving is new or an upgrade of something that already exists, you get naturally to attract fish or customers. Sorry, I'm calling the customers fish. It attracts customers to you, you get, and um, you find that you actually have more success once you are able to navigate your way into the blue ocean and create your own name. We asked ourselves a question initially. Are trends, are current trends being fast tracked or are new trends in the making? For me, my opinion is that it's a chicken and egg situation. You get, it's, it's a cycle, right? Current trends are actually being fast tracked, yes you get. But the current trends are giving rise to new trends, which eventually will become normal and become the current trends, which will give rise to new trends, which will become the current trends, which will give rise to new trends, and so on. You get. So what this does is that it makes the ocean of life a highly dynamic one. And our only chances of survival, either as industries or companies or individuals, is actually dependent on our ability you get to adapt to this rapidly changing, highly dynamic environment that we see, or this highly dynamic reality that we see. And what that means is that we have to maintain our ability to swim. So with these few points of mind, um, I hope I've been able to make at least a little sense of what uh, uh, I think the, 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 of how I think the um, current new, uh, the current reality of the new normal is shaping the trends of today and possibly, you know, the future. So thank you very much for your time. I hope I wasn't too boring. I know that I speak very slowly and all that, and sometimes I can over elaborate, but thank you so much for your time. Let me stop sharing. Screen now and then.